Welcome to our best, the show that will bring you up and close to the Middle Eastern and North African arts and culture life boiling here in the city of London. Tonight we have an amazing show for you lined up. It is an episode of epic themes, starting with a rendition from Oedipus and also haunting artworks based on the story of Sisyphus. First up though, profound music from the Sahrawi people is brought to us by the talented musician Aziz Abrahim. Not just any musician, Aziz Abrahim is a musician born from unique and extreme circumstances. She was born in a refugee camp in Sahara, where her mother had settled a year earlier, fleeing the conflicts between Morocco and the Western Sahara region. She grew up with music all around her, with her community who often sat together and sang their religious and traditional songs, telling ancient stories of the Sahrawi people trials, tribulations and spirit. Uh, yes, growing up in the refugee camps was a very hard experience. Um, we live in very difficult conditions. Uh, and we are completely dependent on humanitarian aid for survival and we don't have a lot of basic things, water and, and, and electricity and all these things that, uh, you know, make life a, a easier. Uh, but, you know, thanks, thanks to the sort of fighting spirit of the Sahara people, um, uh, I, you know, we endure and we carry on. And uh, and so, you know, I'm just like all the other Sahrawis, just trying to make the best of it. Um, my, my music began really within the um, environment of my family. Um, I started to sing when I was five or six years old with my family, with my grandmother, with my mother. And we it started through the singing of religious songs, which is something that we do traditionally in Madah, which is a sort of praise songs to the Prophet. Aziza knew early on she wanted to take her musicianship to a higher level, and after receiving a scholarship to study in Cuba at the age of 11, she came back at 19 to pursue her music career. In 1995, she won the first National Song Contest and then joined the National Sahrawi Music Group, touring Mauritania and Algeria. It was a first step towards a professional music career, after which she started touring Europe with the Sahrawi group Liyad. She went back to the refugee camps in 1999, recording a session for the Sahrawi National Radio. She collaborated with musicians from Spain, Colombia, Senegal and Germany, and created a unique fusion between blues, rock and African music. Aziza's grandmother, a well-known poet, has been a big influence on her choice to be a musician, and she uses her grandmother's poetry in many of her songs, particularly in her debut album. My, my grandmother had a, a huge impact on me. Um, it was really thanks to her beautiful poetry that she transmitted um, the love for music that I feel. And in fact, um, the uh, debut album that came out last year is called Mabruk, which is paying homage to my grandmother and her poems and contains six of the songs are inspired by her poetry. Since 2000, Aziza resides in Spain and is highly influenced by other cultures, which she likes to include and fuse with her surrounding roots. I really love fusion and, and what I was trying to do was to have a, a Sahrawi base to the music throughout but then be able to connect with other music genres which I felt could also help me connect to other audiences, other cultures. At the same time I felt they could benefit from my Sahrawi contribution to the music and, and at the same time I could benefit from what they could um, provide to my music. Um, and uh, the, the songs I sing are primarily in Hassaniya, which is the language of my people. It's an Arabic dialect, uh, but I also s sing some of the songs in Spanish. So my, my connection with Studio Live um, began last year and I feel it's a very important project to support because um, 
uh, we are a, so a society that uh, is based in very ancient culture that has been transmitted over the generations and over the centuries from, genera from generation to generation orally and it's something that is disappearing and it's really important that initiatives like Student Life can help preserve this very valuable culture and, we be and I believe that Studio Live can really uh, contribute to this important process. Aziza hopes to bring enjoyment to people who listen to her music, but also wants to convey the messages of her people and give a voice to the voiceless. She hopes she can encourage and engage an audience, and feels that her struggles are worthwhile if just one person brings the message with them when they leave a concert. Uh, for me, the, the most important thing that I hope my music can achieve is for the message of our struggle, for them to go away with the message of my struggle, my people's struggle. Uh, my songs are in their base, songs of sorrow, so songs of pain, but that doesn't mean that I can't deliver them with an uplifting musical uh, base to them. And so uh, I want people to enjoy themselves and to kind of celebrate my culture, but I want them to be able, hopefully, to, to, to draw the message from my songs. And if I can succeed in, 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 in engaging my audiences, even if it's one person who feels they want to commit to supporting my cause, that for me is already a great achievement and I've done my job. Even though Aziza comes from very difficult circumstances, there's no denying her zest for life and incredibly positive outlook as she looks forward to her future and lives her dreams. I, I don't know how, how to answer that question exactly because I'm not a, you know, a, a, a diviner, but, uh, but I can just say that I'm, I'm a positive person and I like to look forward ahead. And, you know, I came from very difficult beginnings where my mother was carrying me in her, in her belly and, I, and, and gave birth to me in, in exile. So I come from, you know, very uh, difficult roots with a lot, of, as a lot of other people. And I'm not expecting to be comforted in my life, but what, what I really would hope for is that I can have a voice and that my people can have a voice so that they are not left in the state of oblivion and that their dreams to, to return to their homeland can really be fulfilled one day. Ever exploring existential topics, Iraqi artist Sadiq al Faraji brought to us Waiting for Godot, an exhibition about our desires and our perpetual struggles to reach the unreachable. We visited the exhibition and had a chance to speak to the artist himself. Has he gotten what he desires, or is he also waiting for Godot? perpetual struggles that haunt people who have to live in the midst of conflicts like the ones in Iraq, where our artist Sadiq al Faraji grew up, we might never understand unless we have faced them ourselves. For Sadiq, they were part of his upbringing, the shadows looming upon his childhood dreams, and the reason for his final exile to the Netherlands, where he lives today. Despite making a grand journey between two different countries, Sadiq doesn't essentially see a big difference in the fundamental suffering we as humans share. He believes we all go through the same struggles and suffer the same, no matter if we are fighting an outside war or an inside one. And so his artwork erases any borders and brings us together as one. Though he does let us know his experience and the difference between only getting to see a painting in a book in Iraq and coming to the Netherlands where these paintings suddenly were close enough for him to actually touch. Behind the things, behind the scene. So the hidden 
true is the same, Iraq and, or Netherlands. So I didn't feel a big difference, but I do feel big uh, light, big uh, scene as museums, uh, galleries, uh, and so. In Iraq, all things coming to, to me uh, in two ways. Inside, only, or, 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 in one way, actually. Inside the, the page or the paper of the magazines or books. Outside Iraq, I saw the paintings of Van Gogh, for example, as real, and I touch it. <laughs> and they say, what are you doing <laughs> in the museum? Okay, but I touch it. Because all my life, I see these paintings as print. Okay, so when, uh, when I see a real painting of my, of, of we yeah, are such artists I love, like Pickman, for example, I got, I got immediately in love. This is, this is a magic for me, yes. This thing, yes, is different. The sense of displacement from his native country informs his work, and he is captured by concepts of identity, disposition, and a constant seeking of a purpose, or a struggle for achievement of what is unachievable or seems to be non-existent. He looks at the disposition of the identity of oneself and explores concepts of the human suffering. Not unlike the ancient story of Sisyphus, which is one of the inspirations to his exhibition, he questions how we seem to be condemned to an eternal seeking, but never finding a truth about who we are. The statement, I, I put it in, 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 and it was also the title of uh, one of my exhibitions, it was uh, uh, Keep Away. Of, uh, or keep clean of uh, secrets. So uh, that's mean, uh, don't think. But actually, <laughs> what I want to say, please think. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, uh, as much as you know, as much as you lose your uh, 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 how to say it, uh, your power to, to be uh, joyful or something, uh, happy, it's, I don't know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, but on the other hand, the, 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 uh, to, to, to know the reality of your exist, you got a kind of, uh, of happiness. It's sorrow happiness, but it's happiness. It's just like the happiness of the love. Do you know, with love, people not uh, really uh, 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 joyful or something. It is, it, they, are, uh, they are sad, but they are happy. Born in the 1960s in a thriving Iraq, he tells us how he has lived through the decay of his country after each destructive war and what the consequences have been to life and art. 90%, for example, of my work in Iraq, I didn't exhibit it. Yes, I can't. Because it's very uh, uh, clear that I am against the war. So how could I uh, uh, exhibit this uh, kind of uh, fork? You, okay, uh, uh, in these years, the abstract was uh, uh, like uh, uh, golden age in Iraq, because uh, abstract you can't say uh, anything with Abu Sarat and uh, nobody know what, what, what. In, in, in war, with very focused uh, security system, abstract is uh, uh, very easy to do it, yeah. The title of the exhibition, I Do Not Feel That I Am Free, possesses a heavy weight to it, so we had to ask Sadiq, does he not feel free, and does he believe that any of us are. When, when I uh, 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 focusing my choices and uh, 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 my life and uh, uh, look at uh, all things controlled me, 
I will easily discover that I am not free. It looks I'm free. It looks that I can choose between A, A or B. But all these choices has controlled from inside of or around me. The large paintings of the hunched people are made on a bright background to bring out the blackness in the contrast. He uses collage paper and ink and doesn't like to make the black solid, but believes that the contrast between light and darkness is what brings out the darkness in his work. His video installation, Godot to Come Yesterday, is inspired by another story, this time Samuel Beckett's absurd play, Waiting for Godot. In the play, two characters, Vladimir and Estragon, wait in vain for the arrival of a third character named Godot, attempting to distract themselves through various activities and conversations. Sadiq tells us why in his world, Waiting for Godot has turned into Godot came yesterday. I mean Godot, which who we are waiting, is already here, okay? Because he came, he, he is going to come yesterday. So he's here, okay? <laughs> and the other meaning, he is, coming to, he is going to come yesterday, that he will never come. It is a joke, okay? So Godo is us. Godo is you, as you, imagine or hope to be. We all waiting. Uh, uh, you cannot uh, live without this kind of waiting. You have uh, a picture of yourself, you like to be, and you always waiting to, uh, to be this picture, but you never get it. If love is sadness, ignorance is bliss, and life is a struggle from which we will never be free, I cannot help but ask Sadiq, what does he think makes it all worthwhile? Love, only love, yeah. But love doesn't, it's not necessary to be a man and woman, no. Uh, love is th th this feeling to make you belong for something. So when you feel that you are belong for this thing, so this gives your life a meaning. I blogged for my family and for my art and my friends. <laughs>He's a former businessman, holds a diploma in political studies from his native Egypt, and has had a successful career working in shipping in places like Hong Kong and Dubai. But deep down inside, Ahmed El Alfi has carried with him the desire to reach people in a different way, through the medium of drama. After a life-changing decision he made whilst working in Hong Kong, he moved to London to study, graduated with a master's degree in directing, and shortly after started the El Alfi Theatre Company a theatre company with the aim to bridge the cultural gaps between the West and Mideast, and ultimately, the world. The end of giving day and the victory of the beast! All together, please! Yeah. Ahmed tells us about the time he was involved in what he himself calls corporate slavery. He would already then work on his own projects and put up plays on his spare time. One of the plays he directed in Hong Kong was English playwright Dennis Kelly's Orphans, a play he felt so strongly about, he decided to contact Dennis Kelly himself and let him know of the work he was doing. Mr. Kelly subsequently decided to fly out for one night and see it, after which he recommended Ahmed to pursue a career in directing. This became the first step to Ahmed's biggest career change. I always like to reflect what I feel as an artist although I was in the corporate level or corporate industry, but I, I never felt myself. Um, I have always passionate about my career ladder to be coming up the ladder and all that, but I felt I was very strained. Um, and I asked myself a question, do I want to be doing this for the rest of my life? And it, it, it just, it didn't, I thought no, I, I answered myself no, so I, I thought no, I'd release myself from that and, uh, and do something that I would love to do for the rest of my life. 
the fact is that you wake up in the morning and you're really looking forward to your day. That is how I feel. Ahmed started his theatre company with the aim to make foreign playwrights, especially those non-European, more known to the English audience. One of his ideas is to cast actors who are not usually cast for non-European roles, such as the English actors in the comedy of Oedipus who are all playing Egyptian characters. A strategy he believes will hopefully entice the English audience to discover more non-European plays. He also believes that having a cast of actors from diverse background, the audience will connect more easily, as they will have the bits and pieces of characters in the play that they individually can make a personal connection to. How about I actually involve British actors, and even we have European actors as well. We have a, it's a Greek play adaptation, and we have a Greek actor as well. How about if we combine all these cultures together, and we produce something completely unknown outcome, which would, would be definitely exciting, because it's, uh, so I thought, yeah, uh, and that's the core of the, the, the theatre companies, to basically, that's just a start, but hopefully in futures to kind of always tackle um, theatre, through a different, uh, with a cultural twist. Be it, I started with my own background, but I, it doesn't restrict itself to just being Arabic. I could ch select a Japanese play. I could select, as long as it's non-European, um, I think that needs access here more to kind of involve everyone, audience and actors. Egyptian playwright Ali Salem's 1970s version of Oedipus tells us a somewhat different version about this ill-fated man. We spoke a bit about this exciting version with Ahmed. I studied it and I felt it is quite a strong piece. And it's uh, Ali Salem is a, such an established playwright. He wrote Madras de Mushafabin and the School of Troublemakers, which I think shaped the Egyptian culture and the Arab world. Uh, because till date, I still and other people still speak some of the lines in their daily lives well, that, where Ali Salem is. So I thought that is a good uh, representation of Arabic theatre and Egyptian theatre in specific. And then the second thing, I thought, I asked myself, okay, well, I'm not gonna do it to Egyptian people or Arabic people, I will introduce it to British audience. So what would be relevant? So it talks about Oedipus, and Oedipus is a story that is known worldwide. So an adaptation, which is quite exciting, might be exciting for the British audience to see. So I said, okay, that's a great element as well. So that's something gives it an edge, and then, it's set in pharaohs in Pharaonic Egypt. And that's, <laughs> that's history that I think a lot of people would like to know more about. Oedipus, the true starting point to the remaking of man is, is to free him from fear, free him from doubt and anxiety. But how? Is <sighs> how? That's the true riddle. And whoever knows the answer shall create the greatest civilization on earth. The man who can liberate man from fear clearly deserves the title ruler. The question always lies in translated scripts, whether you're faithful to the, um, the script or you're making closer to the target audience. And what I did is I tried to create a balance by making it closer to the target audience, but at the same time preserving the the core of the play, it is still Egyptian. I've had actually some Egyptian friends who attended the, the show and they were like, we didn't feel actually it is an Arabic play at all. There's like, which is, which is fun because it's, it, it is interpreted in, in completely different ways. The whole set of chronic tradition shrinks to nothing and becomes valueless when thieves are exposed to danger. No, I would, I would definitely be uh, doing more uh, political statements and political plays through my art and I, I and I don't usually like to preach about things there's no right or wrong it's always asking questions and raising awareness and it's up to the people to decide what they want to take from them and hopefully one day in future uh, I will be able to kind of translate some modern uh, contemporary English plays to to bring it hopefully to my part uh, of the world, which is quite exciting, and that's uh, so. There's a lot happening, but nothing is completely firm yet. But there is definitely more to come. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the journey through this epic-themed episode. Join us next week as we roam the city for more of the best Middle East arts and culture life London has to offer. Until then, take good care. Next time on Arabesque. 
Celebrating some more New Year in our next episode, this time the Persian New Year takes shape in the exhibition New Ruz at the Gallery Art Space. The largest museum of art and design in the world, the Victoria and Albert in London, welcomed us for a look at Najla Zayn's work, The Wind Portal. And finally, we get to be a part of the world premiere of Syrian director Najdat Ansur's feature, King of the Sands. Thrilling events, intriguing interviews, and beautiful works of art. We bring you all of this and much more here in Arabesque.